welcome to today's presentations on healthy building design for structure engineers. So um, my name is Nina McCallion from Arab and I'm the chair and one of the presenters. The running order today will be a presentation by myself, followed by Sanya and then Simon. We will have Q&A at the end um, and um, the presentation will be 15 minutes. So healthy building design for um, structure engineers. I think many of us might think that that um, is maybe not directly related to structure engineering, sizing of beams, doing foundation design. But hopefully after today's presentation, you will think differently. And I'll make a start by saying that our clients, um, our architect friends, our mechanical colleagues are all very much thinking about well-being and healthy building design. So these are two or three um, snapshots, uh, screenshots from um, a, um, a, a, a forum on um, NLA, which is the um, new um, London Architects. So about architects talking about well-being. It's also a screenshot from the London plan. So this is about planning. So every building that we design in London has to go through planning and some of them will have to go have to, uh, to meet the requirements of the London plan. London plan, one of the new updates is about healthy streets. There's a big focus on healthy and well-being. Um, so this is our architects, this is our planning, this is our clients. Um, well-being, um, healthy well-being is the emotional, it's the um, physical and it's the um, um, well-being of the people. So really it's a big change of focus of um, the people. Um, I think rather than that we are part of a design team and that we have to um, understand what we're designing for, it's also a professional commitment. Um, we're all committed. Um, most of us have signed the structure engineers declarations, which means that we declare climate and biodiversity emergency. With that comes also designing for resilience. So with that is recognizing that our cities um, will change and that um, our buildings and the people um, occupying the buildings might see increasing temperatures. So again, this is about well-being and health of our people. Just a really brief how I think just to reflect everyone's um, how this has changed. So this is what our traditional offices are based on. So this is a 1960s, 50s modern office. And in a way, the model of that, of the modern development movement um, of offices hasn't changed that much. Big open plan. Um, actually, buildings got bigger and deeper. Artificial light, um, very monotonous. Um, you know, it was all designed for efficiency. Same desk. Um, and cramping in as much um, artificial light, um, mechanically ventilated. I think that's really changed. So these are two images from um, a Google. So Google and companies like that completely, um, you know, um, re um, made us rethink what offices are like. It's about experiences. It's putting people at the center of design. So this is about um, people's health, well-being. Um, happiness, right? The word of happiness is now something that we talk about in design. Um, um, so again, I think all of that kind of got exasperated by um, the pandemic where we're now also used more to work from home. So when we come in the office, the office becomes um, a hub. It becomes where we meet people, becomes where we have different experiences from outside. So this is reflected in the designs that we do. So how does that affect um, our structure engineers? Um, so this is another this is in the Guardian talking about. So um, the framework under which some of our buildings, so this is aspirations. So there's different frameworks that pick up health and well-being. Um, one of them is the UN SDGs and particularly the um, goal number three, good health and well-being. So a lot of our clients, again, will um, commit to um, to these UN SDGs goals and um, that will be reflected in the project brief. More specific on well is the um, health um, to IWE, which is the um, International Wellbeing Institute. So they've developed the wellbeing standard, which has have um, seven concepts for healthier buildings. Um, 
probably the most direct link is um, healthy materials. So when we think about um, the materials that we propose for our structures, they will ultimately also be experienced by our um, by the people in the building, whether that's exposed structures or whether that's unexposed structures. But it's also the paint on our steel. Um, you know, the, the, the paint will be off gassing and all of that will impact, for instance, on the quality of the air. So air, it's about clean air, it's about reducing the pollutions. So knowing the materials that we propose in a building, how they will affect over um, is, is, is something that we now have to think about. Um, but it's also more indirect. So if we're talking about light and designing for daylight, um, circadian to um, or the circadian rhythm or um, first of all we might think that light designers but they will they will start impacting um, the story height they will start impacting the the the, the depth of our floor plan they might start um, impacting on the openings in in for atrium so they, they'll start indirectly affecting the structural designs um, the same with comfort. So this is about um, one of the aspects is there is the um, recognizing the connection with uh, nature. So um, um, biophilia. So that that kind of um, links to that humans have an affinity with nature and how that will um, comfort in their well-being. So all of those things will will start influencing designs and will influence our structural designs. I today going to talk about the, the Maggie's Cancer Center, which is um, one of the projects that I've been lucky to be involved in. These are two exam earlier examples that Eric been involved in in London, Barts and um, Hammersmith. But the one I'm going to talk to you today about is the one in Southampton. So Maggie's Cancer Centre is, um, it was started by um, um, Maggie, who, who um, together with Maggie Jenks and uh, Charles Jenks. So Maggie was unfortunate to um, to get cancer and one of the experiences that she had when she was in the hospital was that um, there was a real focus on um, the, the clinical and the real focus on getting her better but what she found was that um, it wasn't um, there wasn't maybe the comfort that was needed for some of these um, very difficult um, moments so they together with um, Charles and together with um, um, Sarah, who was the head nurse, um, they came up with um, the concept of developing a space where people could feel um, um, calm, could feel home, could feel um, safe, could to talk, um, and um, close to the hospital. So this became the Maggie's Cancer Centers, and I think there's about 27 now, most of them in the UK and some even in Hong Kong and Barcelona. So it's been growing and it's been a huge success. So typically the concept is um, very simple. It's a very informed client who knows what they want, knows what the best outcomes. At the same time, they leave the architects with the real liberty to express that. So it's at a residential scale, and um, it really wants to focus on well-being. And one of the key aspects is that um, connection with nature. So <laughs> on the left, you see what um, it's a car park. So being located close to, to um, hospital often means that the site is the car park. So you have to, from a car park, you have to transform that into a serene, really. Um, so it's a, a huge transformation to to um, you know start imagining that as a serene um, place that is green and where people can feel um, tranquility and can feel um, so connection with nature um, um, really appreciation of materials really um, quality um, beautiful design um, the heart of the building is what the, is like the kitchen or it's the hub is where you can make a cup of tea there'll be rooms where um you can break out and you can have um, um you know a more private conversation but generally it's it's kind of like a, a living room type of feel so um we work together with amanda Levert, a fantastic architect who had the inspiration and the, um so they approached the concept by a very simple 
um, plan. So four walls that divide the space, but one large open space that is divided by four walls that also direct people from outside into the building and give this really clear organization of the space. And then four enclosed boxes, which provide that um, enclosed space. So these are some of the photos taken by professional photographers of, of the result that got opened last year. So what you see is that, you know, the graining is still very much in the beginning. But um, what I want to talk to you about is these four walls. So these four walls are um, structural walls and it is really a rethinking of the traditional um, masonry wall. So they were um, executed in ceramic block. Um, beautifully crafted by um, Cumello, a Spanish um, ceramic um, manufacturer. And um, they're not just there as an aesthetic, but they uh, are the main stability and the main load bearing walls. So there are 600 tall ceramic blocks and they, um, they carry the load of the roof, but they also provide stability. And what you can see is that they, you know, the space, all there is, is a floor, the walls, and the roof. And the roof was just a simple timber, um, timber roof. So again, you know, putting um, the effort where it's most needed. So if it's a residential, um, so if um, all the effort was to put in in the walls and uh, the finishes and material, but your structure is is very much on show here and is actually part of the main architecture, the main feeling of the building. So um, again, those four walls. So these four walls really, um, they all appear the same, but they actually are um, doing different things and different things. So when they're external, they're a freestanding cantilever wall. When they're internal, they are load bearing and they're propped by the roof. Um, and when they are um, fully internal, or when they're internal uh, and external, they also, um, that would every um, envelope. So they also provide the rain screen, they provide the insulation. So we had to think about what looked like a solid wall from the outside was providing different functions depending where it appeared, which meant that we came up with a block. So it's a double leaf block, just like a traditional um, ceramic wall, which um, with an outer leaf and an inner leaf and um, was tied together. Uh, with ties, we really uh, we did a lot of trials to really minimize uh, the joints. So um, because of course it was new, we um, and um, where the wall had insulation, what you can see the traditional the 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 block became like a thinner leaf, and we made space for the insulation. And um, there's also openings in the wall. So if I go back, what you can see. It's really how that wall, so depending, so you know, it becomes a bookcase where it's a single leaf. So um, I, this is um, where I want to conclude the presentation. But really what I, my main message for you to take away from this is that I think um, healthy building design assumes um, building design focused on people. And I think more and more as structural engineers, we will be drawn into this um, making these building around people design and whether that's because we have we have to think about healthy materials but it's also about the experience and more and more the structure is part of that okay this is where i'll stop sharing and i'll introduce my next speaker which is sanya Bun Bunchik, who has 14 years expertise in bespoke design lab massed in the structure design. her portfolio covers a broad range of projects, including work on cult, cultural and institutional projects, public art and challenging technical presentations. Um, she'll be showing you a beautiful timber project and I'll be glad to hand over. Sanya, it's up to you. Hello. Hopefully you can um, um, you can see this. Um, I'm not really sure how to keep up with this um, beautiful um, uh, uh, presentation make a center it's such a lovely building um, but I'll try not to uh, make you fall asleep um, so my name is Sanya Buncic I uh, work for a company called intuitive I worked with with timber um, my my entire career starting as a graduate working on small playgrounds and uh, different houses and um, some civic centers um, I love timber um, and um, um, a couple of years ago 
Uh, we have been asked by a company called Bry Forest Limited, uh, which I believe are the only distributors of uh, Noor Holt panels. Um, and uh, they asked us to help design a small um, two-story uh, bespoke house, uh, which is built completely uh, from uh, timber cross-laminated panels. Uh, but these panels are a little bit special because they don't contain any glue. Um, and the house is called Pig Pesh House. Um, so my talk will be um, a little bit about the, the design of, um, um, of uh, Nurholtz uh, panels, um, just to um, hopefully um, give you an idea of what is possible and not uh, and um, open your mind a little bit about this product um, and also uh, about some challenges uh, which you will have um, if you design a building that is um, completely um, out of timber and most of the timber is left exposed. So we have worked with Thomas um, on a few projects before, but I think this is probably the only building um, of this type or maybe even the only building in UK that was built uh, from uh, Nurholtz uh, uh, panels. If you do know another one, please um, type it in the comments because I would really like to know. So when we first started looking at uh, and, and at these uh, uh, panels, I, I, I was like, oh my God, all the literature that I could find online that I could get from uh, Bright Forest and um, Rombach was in German. Um, I don't speak German. Um, so as you can imagine, Google Translator uh, became my um, best friend overnight. Um, don't worry, I did check the translations with a colleague uh, who is German. Um, and uh, so most of this will, will, will not be, uh, you know, untrue. Um, so we will concentrate on two important aspects of, of this, this building, and that was design of the panels um, and a little bit about fire and uh, the challenges that we, we had um, with, uh, with this. So off we go, design. Um, Nurholt, what is Nurholt? Nurholt means pure wood. And as you can see uh, from these two photographs, um, the, those are the, the panels that are completely made out of natural wood. Uh, in simple terms, they are cross laminated timber panels, uh, which are connected with uh, timber uh, beach dowels. Um, this panel was um, developed by a, a German company, a company called Rombach. There are other products on, uh, on the market, but they use timber dowels and not timber screws. And this is really important. So these are timber screws. Um, there is no glue, no chemicals. Uh, chemical treatments are involved in making the, the panels. Um, and this absence of uh, chemicals also provides a healthy living climate, um, especially from those who suffer from, from allergies. Uh, so there are some examples of the uh, Nurholt building in the world, and I believe there is um, an office building in, in Netherlands, uh, which was uh, made completely out of uh, Nurholt uh, panels. Um, and this building uh, got probably the highest or one of the highest uh, overall scores, uh, BRIAM scores, uh, which obviously um, are based, they're, they're assessing management, health, energy, transport, uh, materials, um, I don't know, ecology, pollution, and, and so on. Um, and, and so this is a very healthy product. And if you can use it, um, you, 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 you will not be, uh, it would be a very good one. And uh, um, I, I warmly suggest it. It's a beautiful material to design, you will see. Um, so obviously there are some disadvantages of uh, Nurholtz elements um, and they're mostly structural, unfortunately for us. Um, so because uh, this is a panel that is made out of timber screws instead of glue, like a traditional CLT, um, then um, those panels are, um, uh, when subject to bending and um, forces shear in plane, uh, there is a, a, the, the stiffness is affected by, by the um, slip between the layers. And that's something that needs to be taken into account when you do the design. So in terms of the production, again, it's, there is something I think special about this because they are made in a factory that is made to make these panels. So all the machinery is basically created to, to, to make the panels. 
they're created by hand. Uh, the boards are layered uh, by a couple of people on the mounting table. Uh, pilot holes are drilled first and then screws inserted into the timber boards. And how this works is that the, the timber boards are uh, um, actually um, dried to about, I think, 18% of humidity. Uh, the beach towels are dry to 6% of humidity. So when they are inserted into the boards, they absorb the moisture from the surrounding timber, they swell, and then it connects the, the product into um, a, a cross-laminated timber panel that we can use um, in construction. Um, there are many advantages of, of using a, a prefabricated product like this um, because all the holes, all the prefabrication, uh, um, you know, pipes, slots, and cores, that's all done in the factory and, uh, and the panel comes to site and you just install it like any other CLT. So it's it's really, if, if you have worked with CLT, this wouldn't be um, a product that you don't know how to use. The design is slightly different and we will talk about this a little bit later. So as I said, I, I might not have said this before, but the planks are installed in three different directions. So we have uh, uh, planks in longitudinal direction, in transverse and diagonal. Um, and because of this, um, the, the, the panels are not as big as a traditional CLT panel. Um, so the size is probably, I think, less than three meters by 8.6 meters, something like that. So um, one needs to be aware of it uh, when, uh, when designing with, uh, with uh, uh, newer holds. Um, the planks are tongue and groove. Um, and uh, there is always a side that is visible where screws are not visible. And there is a side, uh, a face of a, of a member where screws um, are visible because of the way the, the panel is made. And that's something that uh, one needs to bear in mind. And because of that, uh, we can have, for example, a wall member uh, which has a face uh, with um, vertical planks or a face with horizontal planks. Um, and, um, and the direction or the, the position of, of those vertical um, members is or the core, there is a core as well in, in the wall panel, uh, will depend on what side of the, of the panel the architect wants to see. And that's very important when you think about the design and when you approach the design. So the position of the longitudinal members will be important for your design. That's something that one needs to bear in mind. Very similar to CLT, but slightly more important. So some panels will have a group of uh, vertical, diagonal, and horizontal uh, uh, member uh, only as one. Some some will have two or, or even three. Um, and this group is called the triple layer. Um, and depending on the number of these triple layers, uh, the, the wrecking resistance of the panels uh, will increase or decrease. So the number of these, these groups will determine the wrecking resistance of your, your panel, which again is something to, to bear in mind. So uh, some basic information um, um, and for the uh, like uh, geometry and intended use. So wood species are pine, fir, um, uh, large Douglas fir, um, strength class C24. Um, I think 90% of the boards is of this class, so you can use that. Uh, when doing the design. Beach screws are all 20 millimeters in diameter. All the boards are between 140 and 210. I mean, you can use 160 if you really need to. Um, and um, different panels will have different density of screws, but it's about 15 screws per meter square. And that's important to understand as well. Um, if, if it's a wall, uh, if it's a slab element, then the external lay layers will always be arranged in longitudinal direction. So you, you will not be able to, to change that. So if these panels are designed properly or a building is designed properly, the, the building can achieve a working life of 50 years. It is, um, you need to understand that the, the actions are only static and quasi-static. 
and uh, uh, the panels should be used only in service classes one and two. And that's because of the, of the difference in the moisture uh, content of the ambiental moisture content, which, which might affect the, the panel um, because it's connected with screws. So that's something to, to bear in mind. Um, in terms of the, of the design, Eurocode 5 uh, is uh, the one to be used. And also uh, for the actions, um, then you would use Eurocode 1, it's typical uh, for any timber product. Um, and um, if you look in Eurocode, uh, Eurocode will provide design rules for a multi-layer beam uh, with a partial shear connection. Uh, which considers a uniform distributed stiffness of the shear connection over the total beam length. And uh, you, can, you can see that in Appendix B and for walls Appendix C. Um, so there are two things to remember, uh, that K-mod should be as K-mod for solid timber, depending on the, on the service class and the loading. And uh, uh, the formation factor is 2.5 times the formation factor for solid timber. If you go to uh, Bright Forest website, you will see a lot of the diagrams and tables that can help you uh, with the preliminary design, which is pretty good. So it will give you uh, a pretty accurate um, thickness of the wall and roof panels that you can you can use uh, for Reba Stage Two, for example, design. But anything beyond that, you should do a proper design. And so uh, on the latter forces, uh, we'll talk about the, the design later and, and just a, a few things that you need to bear in mind. Um, in terms of the latter forces, as, as I said before, the wrecking resistance of a panel really depends on the number of triple layers. Um, and um, for, for example, if you have one triple layer, then your characteristic shear flow resistance is 12 kilonewtons per meter. And then you can simply uh, calculate the, the horizontal force that this can resist. Um, gamma M is 1.3, and that, that's something to bear in mind. So it's not for solid timber, it is for other wood materials. Um, so yeah, a little bit of mix and match. Hopefully this helps. Um, the design. Uh, actual process is uh, using gamma method, which is described in Eurocode 5. Um, and uh, even though, um, uh, and here I'm, I'm going to talk more about the, uh, just to go quickly through a wall design rather than a floor design. In my mind, um, Nurholz is not as um, effective as a, as a floor slab. And there are other all timber uh, or double laminated timber products like bread stapple, which would be more effective. And it's very likely that you're going to use one of those rather than new holes. But so let's let's go through the uh, uh, wall design and everything else is very, very similar. Um, so obviously your design will depend on the uh, wall panel height and the, and the end conditions. So you will need to calculate uh, wall height and the effective length. Uh, the only layers um, that are um, used in the design are longitudinal layers. Um, and, and so, as I say, position of these longitudinal layers, it's really important uh, for this. Um, some material properties you can see here, I mean, they're nothing too um, uh, unusual. Um, they all depend on C24 class. Um, and um, uh, you, you can find this, I think there, there, there is a lot of information on, um, Brett, on um, sorry, uh, Rombach web website. Um, so you can find all, the, all, this, all this there. Um, what is important is that the, the panel design is based on effective section properties. Um, and, and so you calculate effective section properties, you effective uh, second moment of areas, uh, which are all based on the uh, uh, gamma factors. Um, and the Eurocode will, will give you this information of how to, how to do that. And so as soon as you have the uh, effective uh, section properties, you can then proceed onto the uh, just uh, proof um, check, checks for the stresses for the ULS. Uh, which are given in the euro code, um, and and basically your job is half done. <laughs> um, then you need to check the serviceability um, um, state. Um, it needs to, you need to bear in mind that K factor you can see there 
is different for the serviceability uh, check. So you need to go through this process again, which is lengthy process, but it's just simple mathematics. Um, and, uh, and then uh, follow some uh, proof um, equations there from the Eurocode. It's all based on Eurocode. Um, the detailing, it's, it's simple. Uh, it is, again, based on the C24 timber um, and um, um, usually done by screws. Um, so you can use the Eurocode for that. Um, and now something that is a little bit um, unusual, it's fire. Um, and this is specifically related to, to timber buildings. Uh, when you have a product like this, most of the architects would want to leave it exposed as much as they can, um, rightly. It's, it's a beautiful product um, and fire is really important. So most of you know that, uh, you know, when we design buildings of consequent classes 1 to 2B, uh, we, we can use the approved document B uh, to satisfy building regulations. It's really important to understand um, that this set of documents is for common buildings and, and common building situations. Mass timber building, exposed timber, it's not a common building situation. And so uh, you need to bear this in mind when, when designing um, a building. So uh, I'm not really sure if you have ever seen this graph in your life. Um, but this became my um, my nightmare <laughs> when I uh, worked in this house. Um, so um, this graph represents a development stages of a real fire. Um, and um, as you know, fire in uh, timber buildings depends on four things, which is flammability and fire risk. Um, then we have uh, safe evacuation to think about. Uh, we have structural capacity to think about. And we sometimes need to make sure that uh, there is timber self-extension or a decay phase. Um, and so the real fire has four stages. The first one is the growth, and that's when the fire starts and, um, and you, you want to quickly evacuate every, everybody from the building. Um, then between the, uh, at the end of this stage, there is a stage that is called flashover. It's a mid-stage. And that's, that's a, a moment in time when the entire content of the room is engulfed by fire. The fire de then develops into a developed stage. And at some point, we would want to design our buildings to go through the decay stage. Uh, for some buildings, this is not, not required. For example, for, for the Peak Bash House, uh, the, code, the, the, the building regulations didn't require us to uh, prove that there will be a decay stage but some will. Um, if you look at the timber and any mass timber uh, and this product also, uh, uh, there are four things that, that would influence performance of, of uh, timber in fire. And that's the first thing is to understand that mass timber resists fire by charring. We all know that. Uh, we sometimes forget that timber uh, contributes to, uh, as a fuel. <laughs> and it will contribute to fire severity. Um, a part, the compartment geometry is really important and it will influence fire behavior. And obviously, depending on the height of your building and the use, uh, the um, evacuation strategy will be slightly different. And that's something to bear in mind. So if you look at the, uh, at the uh, timber performance um, and, and, um, and the graph that we looked before, what we had in, in um, a Peak Pesh house was exposed um, uh, cross laminated timber wall with exposed ceiling panel. And so uh, there, there could be um, an effect called re radiation uh, when the heat increases. Um, and then it goes through the charred uh, rate. And actually, the panel continues to burn rather than stop burning. And then you don't have this. Um, decay phase and you have the continued burning of a building and that's something that building controllers was very um, concerned about um, and the reason why they were concerned about is was uh, of, because of the internal fire spread of the or, or the fire spread of, um, of the linings 
And when you look at the graph and some uh, and the internal fire spread, you can see that that uh, basically um, uh, influences the first part of the of this curve, which is the growth of fire. Um, and we had to uh, improve the the linings because the linings, the the, the building regulate actually the approved document B. Uh, requires the line to be of certain classification C, and our panel uh, was um, of uh, lower classification. Um, and so we had to apply um, Envirograph uh, onto the walls. They, they didn't um, accept um, other uh, performance-based uh, design. So that's something to really bear in mind. And so our takeaway from this was that um, as an engineer, you, you would need to manage expectations of, of your architect and the client in terms of how much of the building can be left exposed. Um, you, you would probably want to involve local um, uh, authority um, and, um, and um, stakeholders to buy into your um, fire strategy. Um, and also you will need to have a good fire engineer to quantify the performance. Um, but um, this, this is all that can be overcome. And um, I suggest you enjoy and try to, to use timber as much as possible because it's a beautiful material. And if treated with um, some respect, will give you great results. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then I'll um, introduce Simon Corby. So we will hear from Simon Corby, who has worked under the umbrella organization of Sustainable Development Foundation, initially working for the Good Homes Alliance and now working for the ASBP to enable real change in the industry and help deliver low carbon healthy buildings. So very much on topic. Before I pass over to Simon, please make sure to ask any questions for all speakers in the Q&A box on the right. -hand. We will answer as many as possible at the end. Simon, the floor is yours. Go for it. Thank you very much. I'm struggling to <laughs> load my presentation here, so uh, you'll be fine. You've it worked before. Uh, Maybe in the meantime, just to give you a little bit of a go, the, um, I see a few questions come up. So first of all, Joe Giddings, hi, son. Your great presentation. Thanks. Yeah, I can totally agree with that. Um, then there's a question from Richard Bowdler Bailey from the partnership. Associate Structure Engineers. Um, typically, the architect will be the role that focuses specifically on ensuring many of the seven healthy concepts are included, light, comfort, etc., um, in accordance with client. How assertive, verbal, proactive should, should the structure engineer be in pushing the need for healthy building design, or is it more about awareness and providing a supporting role to the architect? That's a great question. Um, I can have a go at it. Sanya, you probably can also have a go at it. Do you want to unmute yourself and have a respond to that? Yes. Well, um, I, I think as structural engineers, we are responsible of um, if we do have information of what is available and we know um, uh, how to um, um, design. We need to be a part of this design process and try to influence the architects um, because we have worked. It's it's the fact that our profession is that we work with many architects, and so we are probably more likely to to be aware of new materials than an architect who has worked in a, a specific field uh, for years, and so can bring this knowledge of materials that are used in some other, for example, you know, people didn't use timber a lot in uh, in office buildings before. Um, it was mainly used in residential. And so architects yeah. who were involved with, uh, with this type of building would not necessarily think of it as a material to be used. So I think we definitely need to be present in those conversations and try to influence as much as we can. Um, I totally agree. And I think there's a real shift. Right. I think um, more and more there'll be, you know, and it just shifted yeah. from um, that maybe um, only the some of the project, but I think now the majority of the project will look at structure engineers to be really proactive in that. And you're right, you know, you, you're always dealing with other people with the project constraints, but um, we all have a, 
party play. So yes, be proactive and keep opposing. And it's a, it's a supporting role as well, right? To show people the possibilities will help every particular yeah. Simon, how are you getting on? Do you need yeah. a bit of help? I'm so sorry, but I just can't seem to uh, open my presentation. So don't worry, don't worry, what at all. Um, I had a question for Sonia. I was really intrigued about the lure holds, so, so not using any glue and, um, you know, using um, humidity properties, so the, the moisture content, but drying it and then basically letting it absorb and that really making it um, becoming a, um, that, that holds it all together because it kind of gets snug fit. Um, at the same time, when when it's not mechanically or glue glue fixed, this whole this whole uncertainty a bit like how fixed is it? And I just wanted to um, yes. Uh, so so there have been uh, products on the market before. I think the Thomas Thomas holes or something like that, which used the timber dowels, but really timber dowels, not the screws. And um, when um, I I think th there are examples of those panels when they when the moisture changes, the boards basically, obviously, you know, the boards detach from each other, and and the dowel start, starts to dowels start to pop out. But this is not the case here. These are screws inserted. Fine, in so it's mechanical. Fine. Like it's almost like a mechanical fixing, and the screws do have a shear resistance of five point seven or five point nine kilonewtons per screw. There is. 15 per meter square. So there is quite a bit of resistance there. And some of the boards of the layers are tongue and groove. And that Fine. also helps. So the external layers are tongue and groove and they do not open up um, when the moisture changes. Right, because that's clearly it's also a fire case. Really, really There's a few questions yeah, yeah. coming in. Um, Sanya, can you, for big for pig patch house, were any areas of the newer holds panels able to be left exposed yes. without fire, without yes, fireproof can. glue, sorry, to avoid delamination? Was encapsulation the only option? And does this not remove any biophilic? So yes, you're saying no, no. Uh, walls, most of the walls in in a uh, uh, pig patch house were left um, exposed. Oh, we can now see the oh, um, so presentation. So let's let's hear. But I will come back to this question. Yeah, perfect. So sorry, everybody. Um, please excuse me. So my name is Simon Corby. I'm a, a chartered surveyor and director at the Alliance for Sustainable Building Products. So we're a not-for-profit uh, organisation. We're mission-led, and we're a membership organisation. And we share learning through lots of events. We participate in research projects. We advocate product standards. And we do a lot of work responding to policy consultations. So we've got over 100 members now, which is great. We're growing nicely. Um, and it's a real mix of architects, specifiers, not so many engineers in there. Um, so we've got lots of events coming up. We've got an event this afternoon that's having a look around Europe, around policies and tools to encourage more bio-based materials. And then on Thursday, we've got a a carbon comparison of timber, steel, and concrete, which I'm looking forward to, and a range of other events coming up soon. Our awards are open. I urge you to submit an award. They're free. It's easy to submit and some quite exciting prizes. So uh, just a quick flash on a, a Interreg uh, research project we're up to. Uh, it's great working with our French colleagues. So our definition of, of healthy buildings is really um, healthy products, healthy people, healthy planet. Now you can't really have one without another, without the other. So we extend health into all of these things. And it's just a reminder really that we're not all the same. So um, neurodivergent people uh, are estimated to be one in five. And so um, well-known examples of which are autism, ADHD, dyslexia, um, and there's a new uh, PAS um, being developed by British Standards Institution, which is open for consultation. Well worth to have a look just to familiarize yourself um, with um, these things. We have our uh, Healthy Buildings uh, Conference um, coming up next year. Our definition of healthy buildings is products, people, planet. 
So just a reminder, as I was saying earlier, that um, one in five folk are neurodivergent, autism, ADHD, dyslexia. Um, so a large percentage of the population um, are slightly different and think differently and affected differently by buildings um, and um, noise and light and so on. So something that we need to understand and get our heads around. So um, talking about healthy planets, so the World Green Building Council reminds us that actually net zero um, must include embodied carbon. Um, so this is a uh, an expansion of their definition. So uh, if you're going to lose a low carbon material, there's nothing better than using uh, what's underneath the, the building itself. Um, and so um, there are a number of uh, earth buildings. Uh, this one is Rammed Chalk. It's the first of its kind in Kent, built to Passive House Principles. There's a link there if you want more information. Um, so um, beautiful building, uh, Rammed Chalk. So you can see the chalk here. It's such an uplifting building to, to work in. Uh, and and a great Spanish tiled ceiling there. So um, uh, timber, well, Michael Gove tells us that um, steel and concrete are, are going out of fashion and timber's coming into fashion, which is brilliant. But we are reminded that we need more timber buildings, not more timber buildings by our board member, Jane Anderson. Yeah, we heard about biophilia earlier on this morning. So it's an innate connection to nature. It's how we feel, it's where we feel most relaxed. And that's why a building with natural materials um, uh, resonates so much with all of us. And if you've heard of the wood wide web, um, trees are much more um, are connected than you think um, and sending messages to each other and sending food. Really interesting uh, short video there. I urge you to watch that. So why timber? It's the only renewable man mat uh, natural material. It's uh, low embodied energy and um, it sequesters, so soaks up carbon from the atmosphere, and it's a renewable source and a circular product too. So uh, the Timber um, Development uh, uh, UK organization did a great event the other day with two um, guys, James Norman, and Andrew Thompson, and they were sort of saying that, so the embodied carbon, in, uh, more than 50% is in the structure. So as, as uh, structural engineers, um, foundations, 24%, floors, 15, frame, 24%. Um, so if you're looking at how you can reduce these things, we've got a, a talk with one of our members coming up or earlier, uh, next, uh, later in the week. Um, so catch that. Um, so here's a, a quick slide from that presentation, and the link is uh, there. Um, so it shows you what you can do to reduce the embodied carbon in your, uh, in your structure. Uh, whether it be concrete, steel, and timber, uh, and typical targets. So the iStruct T put out um, this document, making low carbon material choices earlier on in the year. And uh, as if by magic, all the materials ended up having the same embodied carbon, um, which um, caused a lot of disconcern amongst many folk. And the reason why uh, they're all the same is that actually the grid width was nine meters, which is means that you, meet, you need very long and very wide chunks of CLT to be able to have those types of spans. So if we'd have had a seven meter grid, it'd be a very different number. A couple of quick case studies. So this is the spine, um, one of our members, Morgan Sindel. It's platinum well standard. So they claim it's the, one of the world's healthiest buildings. So it'd be fully fitted out to well um, and um, so it's um, got all sorts of exciting things here. So this is the facade, which is basically looks like human skin under a microscope and lots of natural materials on the interiors. So um, they've used the human body to inspire the design and the structural layout, staircases and natural materials. So just a reminder that heritage and timber go nicely together rather than knocking buildings down. Perhaps we can just uh, use timber to um, breathe a second life into them. And we've been working on uh, what's called the Timber Accelerator Hub here at ASPP to investigate the major barriers that are preventing the wider adoption of mass timber, um, funded by the Loudest Foundation. And we've been, sorry, let's just go back one. Okay, so we've been looking at um, all of these barriers, insurance, regulation, fire safety, supply and life cycle analysis. 
and working across a range of stakeholders in all of these. And so I'm trying to overcome all these individual barriers. If you're interested in finding out more, just sign up to our newsletter. So um, Hackney um, has the most timber buildings um, and something like um, 35 or so in Hackney. We're doing walking tours um, before COVID, um, partly because it all um, stemmed from Hackney's wood first planning policy, um, which was uh, slightly um, unofficial, but uh, it's been introduced in Paris in Wales. And this is up for the Sterling Prize. This is um, a mosque in Cambridge, just beautiful use of timber here. So just suggestions for further reading um, to help you look at uh, structural awards, structural uh, engineering, and then do get involved with ASPP, sign up to our newsletter. And um, yeah, we look forward to uh, working with you. These are my colleagues, that's my contact details there. So I'm so sorry for um, all my technical problems. I'll hand uh, back to you, Nina. Thanks, Simon. Glad you got it working because it's a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Hi, that should all of us be back on the screen. Um, I think we've got still a little bit of time. I'm okay to overrun a little bit um, for yeah. some questions. So we, I think we got halfway some of the newer Holtz presentation. Um, um, so I think um, there was a question from um, Seb Barrow from GS Mac W U U S U O engineer. Hello, Sonia. Can you share a bit on the chemicals for wood treatment, please? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm <Okay. gone. laughs> unfortunately not here, but uh, no. I'll, I have your phone, uh, your email address, so we can uh, touch base. But uh, just to say on Noor Holtz, they come to site protected. Um, so, um, and, and they are used in classes one and two. Um, so detailing is very important. Um, so they are always lift from the ground. All the, all the usual uh, things apply. Um, so, so they are never left exposed uh, to the elements. Um, and so that's the reason why it doesn't require um, chemicals, if at all. Um, so yeah, um, I think that's what I can say on, on this. Yeah, get them internally as quick as possible, protect them yeah. during construction yeah. transport, and then it's an internal environment that we're dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is another question, um, again, on timber, which is probably more to the team wider. It picks up on um, the shift by the in, um, insurance industry to move away from using combustible materials. Um, there's, of mm -hmm. course, the building regs that have also been updated, um, all following the horrible events. Um, and Oscar Baldry, he then goes on to give an example of a care home that recently was schemed in timber and then changed to load bearing masonry. How are you dealing with this on projects? Do you want to go, uh, Sandra? Oh, yeah, I, I can. But I'm sure anybody else, uh, I mean, everybody mm. can contribute to this. So my view is that in terms of the uh, approved documents, be they're prescri prescriptive. We we live in modern times where we use modern materials. We should be able to involve a, a good fire engineer to help us in a project and do a, a fire a performance based design um, to suit our building, especially if it's a timber one. Buildings will not be the same. So we can't really use a, a guidance. I wouldn't use the guidance. I would always go with the science. Um, so whether whether the approved document be is suitable for timber buildings, in my view, it's irrelevant. Um, uh, it should be every timber building should be looked on a case by case basis. And um, there, there are some um, tests um, which are done on, on compartments. And if you and I think in Canada and Northern America, this is what they do. So they build, they spend a lot of money in building compartments, they test them, and they say, okay, if you have this arrangement of the walls of the, I don't know, ceilings, this, this how much is exposed, you can safely build um, a, a structure out of it, and it will satisfy your, your fire regulations. Um, whether we do that for every building, I don't know. Um, but um, I would always go with the science and, and the expert guidance on this. Um, so 
can't say anything. Now. Yeah, I just I, I I can I can um expand on that. I totally agree. Um, having designed three buildings in the last four years with exposed timber, and one of them in uh, student housing in Cambridge, um, also for Sky, the main office on um, health. Um, yes, regulation have changed, and I think there's two two things that I would like to say. One is to demystify a bit the regulations because there's a lot of talk about it and sometimes um, um, things get not accurately um, taught. So the re building regulations don't say that you can't use timber in buildings, right? It's very specific where you can use it and how not to use it. So I think using it in a facade is already different from using it in a structure. Using it in a structure and you're getting exposed. So there's different levels of using it and it's a very... so. Just by saying, you know, you can't use timber in, in, in buildings, it's just simply not true. And that's also not what the building regs are saying. So I think we need to, whenever we quote the building regs, I, I would like to be really specific. And this is also the feedback to the insurance. Having said that, you know, there is a real risk with timber. So at the same time, we need to take it very seriously. And that's what, just like Sanja did in her, in her presentation, it's really working through the different steps. How is it used? What is... The, and with fire, it is not just simply introducing combustible material, but it's about, you know, it's um, it's those different components when you look at fire design. So what is the fire load? What is the risk of the people? How is it used? How is it? And is it a risk to life safety? Is it a risk to property? So it's so doing a proper review of that before. Um, but I think we, as, as an industry, we have a real challenge to be accurate about this. And um, because before, you know, things get get set in the wrong way so we can definitely use timber we should use timber more but do it really carefully and do it really considerably and just keep making really good example projects and that will mm -hmm. help uh, build the gates okay sorry <laughs> um i said okay then i just want to get maybe so Another... I've got a few things to yeah. add into that. Yes, so please. Oh, sorry. The Timber Accelerator Hub has been working with the insurance industry, trying to upskill them about CLT and how it performs in fire. And the CLT industry has been spending a lot of money on doing large scale testing, which is underway, just about finishing, actually. And so we'll have some results to share with everybody in about sort of six to eight weeks time. Um, so we can draw your attention to that. Um, and just to say, there are a couple of um, uh, insurance brokers that are specialising in CLT. So there's Chase, Philip Callow, and uh, Dominic Lyons from Gallagher's. So these guys are are very supportive of the timber, uh, our whole timber building, uh, and will help you um, through the through the process. So do engage with them nice and early. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, let's have a look. Maria Leon, one of the key issues barriers with adopting with is fire. We spoke about that. I think there's a lot on fire. You know, that's a massive topic on its own. Um, one another about specific neural hold systems from Aris Georgia can be constructed as prefab. How to minimize on-site construction time and elimination? Many things. This is fully prefabricated it's it's you don't you don't alter the everything is done in the, in the factory all the all the cores for uh, uh, cables if they're hidden um all the cutouts all the service voids everything is done in the factory so yeah one one shouldn't um um alter it on site Totally. So there's a real effort at the early stage of design, but yeah. what you then win is a fully, yeah. you know, prefabricated. It's not just redu reduced construction time, right? It's also it's one yeah. of the quietest construction. You literally have a few people on a few moves with a hammer mm -hmm. rather than um, it, it's it's a very um, clean, um, um, uh, uh, silent. It's a very fantastic. <laughs> you know, if you use two big concrete and big steel, this is like the other. Um, spectrum. Um, just a question to say, would you say the main driver to you newer holes is that omission of chemicals and is it that health benefit? Yes. Yeah, that okay. was the main that was the main reason why the owner yeah. of the house wanted to use new holes. And um, when uh, the well, um, the the issues with the with fire. So 
firstly, uh, no hold panels are rated for fire. They are tested and they, they can, uh, I think they have rating of 180 minutes. Some panels, some panels can also withstand 240 minutes. So they can be used structurally. You can show by charring. There is a design, a fire design uh, that you go through, very similar to the structural design, uh, where you can prove that the panel, uh, even without testing, can, can withstand this. Um, so in terms of that, it's very similar to CLT, even better because there is no glue and some glue degrades in fire. Uh, so here we don't have that problem. It's solid timber um, and they're tested. But what we had a problem was this fire spread of, spread of flames and, and the, the, the speed of the uh, spread of fire through, through a building and the building control was not really happy with that. So we did the fire um, a performance based mm -hmm. fire design. Um, and we have shown that by improved um, uh, detection of fire, uh, we reduced uh, a probability of that by 6%. Uh, but they still were not happy about that. Um, and so we had to apply um, chemical treatment on that, which at the end, it, it gave visually great results. Uh, but it def defied the purpose of it. Um, and also, um, I'm not really sure how, to be honest, how effective that surface treatment is on timber laminated timber. Uh, it doesn't make sense. So it, it, in terms of our design as structural engineers, we are happy, the architect is happy that this will work without the treatment. Um, so the treatment was basically placed there, there to make other stakeholders happy, which is not a great um, result. So this is um, a moral of this story. Involve them very early on, make them sure that they understand what the problem is, how to solve it, give them good arguments, involve the science. And um, and we since then we had some very successful stories, even with timber in the, in the um, external cladding or very close to external cladding. So. It can be done, but you do need to talk. We, we as professionals, as the industry, we need to talk to each other. And I think we forgot to do that. Good. Great. Um, there's another question about fire. Let's, let's skip that one for a second. Um, I'm not sure how we are on time. Maybe we do two more questions and then... Um, um, there's a lot there's there's some questions about um sharing this information and um i know that kirsten has all asked us to share this so um uh, this information will be available after um for maria leon no that's the fire one there was a question another one about um umar ability from university of leeds student please can hi sonia please can you talk about moisture content for the external oil panel panels or walls, especially for tropical regions where humidity is a problem. I'm sorry, this is not a problem. No, <laughs> no I was about to say no. probably not in no, tropical probably. regions. Tropical regions, I would suggest bamboo. <laughs> yeah, and it's not just moisture content, right? We've got all sorts of no, bugs that will just... No, it yeah. is not the, no, no, this, this is, is not... This is yeah. the um, uh, Western world, you know, class one and two, fortunately. <laughs> Very limited. <laughs> Yeah, in a very simple way, I think, you know, use the trees that are local, they yeah. kind of are adapted to the climate. Uh, this is not, you know, yeah. uh, but in yeah, if, if the tree doesn't occur in, in that type of the world, there's probably a reason for it. it, it, it yeah, um, not a question, but a thank you. And then a final question. Um, so this is about changes on site. Um, in mass timber structures when everything is prefabricated. Well, um, y you know, yes and no, timber is great to to cut holes in and to do it because it's a very soft material and it's very workable. At the same time, um, the whole idea with prefab is that you do as much design up front because any changes afterwards need, to, you know, there's probably a little bit of flexibility in there, but typically we would not um, big openings being cut through structural members once on site. So yeah. and, and just to add for newer holes specifically, it is almost virtually impossible to do that. The the panel is created by mechanical fixing of timber towels. They are 
carefully positioned where it needs to be. You don't want to counter that. So, so careful thinking up front, and then you've got a really good product, but mm -hmm. um, don't leave that for later, many changes. Okay, then I was gonna thank the panelists. Thank you so much. It was great to be part of that. Um, I got a lot out of that and hopefully we make the case that there is a lot to do for structural engineers in the realm of healthy building design.